Okay, uh, so welcome. And uh, those of you watching at home, if you want to download the June 2000 LSAT to work from, you can. However, um, everything we need from that LSAT today is going to be right up on the screen, so actually not necessary. Um, one of the things we're really going to push today uh, is working on some drills for our new five pound book, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second. And we're going to be talking a lot about um, causal arguments. Um, so we're going to get into a bit of that. Um, those are those are the main things on the docket today. Um, if you want to check out one of our classes, you can try one out live online. Um, and you can also try our interact course, which is a self-paced option that you can do for self-study. Okay. Let's jump right in. Uh, so like I said, I wanted to uh, share something from this new five pound book <laughs> that I worked on. Uh, I, uh, I ended up, initially I was, I was I have to say I was skeptical about this project. <laughs> um, one of my coworkers said, hey, we're gonna make this five pound book. We have this book, we have this product for other brands, including for GRE. And for GRE, it was really necessary because the published GRE materials were really scarce. Um, so when they told me we're gonna make a five pound book for the LSAT, I thought, that's weird because the LSAT is nearing, you know, 10,000 official published questions that you can do. Um, you're never going to run out of LSAT material unless you're, you're studying like crazy. Um, so why do we need to write a bunch of material when students should be studying for the real thing? But after I got to work on editing it and, and, and you know, putting a lot of these drills together and choosing concepts for it, I saw a lot of uses for it. And, and maybe you're finding some of that um, as, as, as you work through it. Um, a lot of it's about working on specific details. If you need to work on prephrasing the answers to questions, if you need to work on uh, conditional logic, if you want to work on uh, actually recognizing vocabulary that's used on the LSAT, it's great for that. Um, a lot of it's going to push you on things that are hard to do with the LSAT, uh, with official practice. I can always do, you know, if you want to work on strength and weakening the argument, if you want to work on flaw, there's a ton of official material to work from, and you should work from that. That's the best thing to work from. But if you're trying to think, how do I predict an answer in? Is that, was that a good prediction? If I'm trying to get a sense of what kind of answers even make sense for this question type, um, that's really important. If you think about anything that you're expert at, right, whether it's a sport or playing an instrument or cooking or, or you know, judging people, whatever it is, a lot of times there's these little micro skills you don't even think about, right? When you read a question, how quickly do you say, oh, I know what kind of question this is? We we're talking before class about sufficient versus necessary, right? Um, how do I... How do I recognize what they want from me? What kind of answers would work? And how do I get a sense of things, some things that just couldn't possibly be in, right? Um, a lot of times we narrow that down and a really solid LSAT taker might have a pretty good sense of what the answer is without even having read all the information, right? I might look at a Rena comp question and be able to knock out some of the answers or maybe even all of the wrong answers without having read the passage at all, just by saying, that's not likely, that's not likely. I can't do that every time, obviously. It's not a magic power. But sometimes it feels like it. Sometimes there's a bit of that. So we try to push a lot of those things. So prediction, recognition, um, a lot of those skills are really important in there. Um, so let's try a draw out of the book. I'm going to share one here. Yeah, sometimes you feel like you're being too tough on the answer choices. Yeah. Uh, it, on the one hand, that's a sign of, of, of strength because you want to be super tough and critical. I would rather knock out all five answer choices and cycle back round um, than not be able to knock out very many at all. Yeah, so you go through and you go, what, that's it? One of these is the right answer? Um, it would be like if I said, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say I showed you a picture and asked you, which of these is a picture of my parents? Um, and you're looking at the pictures and, you know, some of them aren't human, it's a picture of, you know, a couple of sheep or something like that. And you think, well, I don't think he's a sheep, right? Or you see a picture of people that look like they're from the Middle Ages or something like that. You think that can't be them, right? What's going on here, right? Um, and then, you know, finally it turns out, I don't know, uh, it was from a movie, you know, uh, they were dressed up as if they were from the Middle Ages or something like that. And you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. So sometimes we're too quick to, to cross a lot of things out and they say, is there any way one of these can be right? So again, I'd rather have that critical faculty and knock out uh, a whole bunch of answers than then always go, well, that works and that works and that works and I'm too sold on it. But sometimes we have to get a feel for what can I really knock out and what do I just feel suspicious of? So what, a lot of times in our curriculum, we'll talk about deferring judgment. As we go through, we're not worried about definitively choosing an answer. We're more saying, is this even possible? So sometimes we need to just loosen our filter a little bit and say, okay, well, A's out of the question. B, don't love it. Let me hold on. 
C, definitely no. D, don't love it. E, don't love it. Okay, so it's B, D, or E. Let me go back and run through those. Um, and that's a really, that's a really common scenario. Right? That, that's something that you want, you know, you'll be fine at. But it's okay. Will you sometimes knock out all five and go, what the heck? Yeah, I do that too, right? It, it, that's fine. Um, so partly it's a matter, again, of just knowing what to expect and what would be reasonable. Sometimes you're going to have a very specific prediction um, that works. Other times you'll have a very specific prediction that they've kind of led you to, but there's another way. So one way you can tell a hard question is if there's a pretty obvious answer, but then they don't give you that answer, right? Um, you know, again, is this, picture, is this picture of a, well, here, the goat by me. Is that goat one of my parents? Well, no. Why not? Well, obviously, I'm not a goat, right? So that's like the duh answer. But maybe there's some other reason, right? Like the goat's younger than me. Oh, well, that too, right? That's less important, it seems like. Like no goat is my parent, right? Um, you're like, why are you talking about your parents being sheep and goats, right? But uh, looking for those kind of things, sometimes the slightly less obvious or even very unobvious answer is, is what kind of gets us on this harder one. Studying the LSATs like trying to catch an eel. Uh, I can see that. There are a lot of patterns, though. There are a lot of patterns. And partly what, what we'll talk about today is recognizing which pattern applies in which situation. And that's really important. Some people want to make all of life about one thing. You know, everyone in life is either a giver or a taker or something like that. And is that always really true? Is it more complicated than that? You know, um, if I said every question in the LSAT is either about conditionals or about comparisons, well, are they all about that? A lot of them are, right? So what we have to do is recognize a number of different kinds of patterns, right? Just like, you know, when people try to reduce every movie screenplay to the same structure. Well, there's multiple kinds of plots. Is it a, is it a you know, love story or is it a, that, this or that? Maybe it has a slightly different structure, right? Even though they might be related. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about patterns. So let's, let's share some. I'm gonna start with a, with a drill from the five pound book. Um, so let's put this up. So here is a, is a, it's a couple of items from one of our drills about counterexamples. So let me explain what this drill is asking about just to give you a little context. Uh, and then you can let me know whenever you're ready to talk about it. But the idea is, in some cases, we need to weaken an argument by showing that it doesn't have to be, that doesn't always have to work that way. So we'll come up with a counterexample, right? So if I say tall people are always good at basketball, and you say, hey, my cousin's eight foot nine and he's terrible at basketball, then okay, that's a counterexample. It doesn't prove that no tall people are good at basketball, but it weakens the idea that they always are, right? So we're looking for counterexamples a lot of times where we're trying to weaken or find, find fault with an argument. So here are a couple. Um, it's possible for, for uh, these that there could be more than one right answer. So I, don't want you, I want you to consider each one very carefully. Don't be too quick to cross them all out. And I'll tell you right now, there's at least one right answer in each column, right? So it's not a trick question where they're all wrong. Um, so which of these would be counterexamples to each of the following claims? Let me know if you need clarification. Other than that, I'll pause and, and give you some time to think. And when you're ready to discuss the two of them, uh, let me know.
All right, let's see how we did. So the idea is we want a counterexample. We want something where we say, hey, if this is true, think of think like a weekend. If this is true, the initial claim might not work out so well. So for the first column, it's difficult to become emotionally invested in novels with disreputable characters. Um, did you find something you liked? Was there something that seemed to, uh, to be a counterexample? Okay, so one and two. Um, so these are both talking about people's novels uh, and whether they're disreputable or not, right? Um, one way to see if these are counterexamples is to see what kind of statement this are, they're, uh, they're making, right? One thing that's, that's interesting uh, between the first, uh, first claim and the second claim is that if you look at the way they're phrased, the first claim says, it is difficult to do this in novels with this trait. So this causes difficulty with that. The second one is talking about something being responsible for something, right? So if we think about how we represent those, they're a little bit different. Um, were you able to recognize uh, the first one as a conditional statement? Could we write this as a conditional? Wow. In other words, I could I say something like, hey, uh, if disreputable characters, then difficult to invest. See what I'm getting out there? I'm saying that when yeah, if it's a novel with disreputable characters, yeah, then it's difficult to invest. So you can write that as a conditional, right? So one thing that's useful to think about is then how would we uh, how would we knock that out? What kind of thing would disprove that? Think back to me saying that tall people are good at basketball. How do we disprove it? We found a tall person who wasn't good at basketball, and the argument fell apart, right? It depends, of course, on what I'm saying. If I'm saying t being tall makes you better at basketball than you would otherwise be, you might say, hey, yeah, this cousin who's seven foot nine or whatever, he's no good at basketball, but just imagine if he were three feet tall, he'd be even worse, right? Uh, at least the tall person can reach the hoop pretty easily, all right, despite his other missing skills, right? Whereas here, I am saying, if this happens, it's just gonna be hard to do, period, right? Um, so we have to think about, how we uh, we could weaken it. I'll, I'll, so I'll tell you one thing, out of the first two, one of them, one out of those first two uh, is a counterexample, weakens, and the other isn't. So if you had to pick one of those first two, which one would you pick? First one, and why the first one? Uh -huh. You try to do the contrapositive. So what would the contrapositive be in this case? Right. For those who haven't seen a contrapositive, it's you, you flip and negate, right? So if I say A, A, if A, then B, uh, you could also say if no B, then not A, right? If, uh, if sugar makes something sweet, then if it's not sweet, then there's no sugar, right? So if it's not difficult to invest, it's not disreputable. Now the contrapositive, is that something that goes against the conditional or does that go along with the conditional? Yeah, it's the same statement as original. So we want something that would break one of these in a sense, right? So let's look at what statement one says. It says the characters in Anson's novel are not disreputable. Now notice that that doesn't provide the sufficient condition of either of the statements. The first version that we wrote, the original, is if disreputable, then this. 
The second one says not difficult to invest than this. So this one is saying that uh, they are not disreputable. So if they're not disreputable, we don't need to know anything about them one way or the other, right? Notice that if the author had said, the only thing that stops someone from investing emotionally in characters is if they're disreputable, if that's the only thing, right? Then the statement one would be a great way to attack the argument. But they didn't say that. There could be other things that stop you from becoming emotionally invested, right? Maybe you also won't become emotionally invested in the characters um, if they don't seem real to you. Or maybe you won't be invested if you don't ever read the book, right? Um, you can't be invested then, right? Maybe you won't be invested um, if the characters don't seem realistic or if they remind you of someone you dislike in real life, whether they're disreputable or not, right? So there might be various ways you don't invest. Maybe you don't invest in them if they make foolish choices, right? So there could be all these other things um, that certainly might make you not invest in them. What we're concerned about is if they are disreputable, does that force you not to? So do you see why we don't want Statement one. Does that make sense? Compare that to statement two, where they say, hey, it has disreputable characters. But it's easy to invest. That's like the example of my tall cousin who's bad at basketball, right? If tall people are supposed to be so good at basketball, what goes on when I know someone who's really tall who's bad at basketball? It ruins the, the argument, the initial argument. So one takeaway you can get from that is to, uh, to weaken a conditional claim, grant the sufficient, uh, and deny the necessary. Another way to say that would be show that the sufficient thing can happen without the necessary. So if I say every time it rains, it's cold, show me a case where it rained where it wasn't cold. Oh, I was in Singapore and it was 95 degrees out. And it, was, uh, it was raining, right? It rained, but it was 95 degrees. So rain doesn't always mean cold, right? So if I can, if I can grant the sufficient and deny the necessary, uh, then I've shown that that conditional statement doesn't have to be true. Okay, so there's one more in this column that works. See if you can find another one that does the same idea that grants the sufficient but denies the necessary. Yeah, right? Number four is saying Duncan's novels have disreputable characters, but it's easy to become invested, which of course is very similar to what they said in two. The only difference is the order of presentation. So this is just like number two. It says easy to invest, even though they're, they're disreputable, right? Notice we don't care about three because it's talking about emotionally complex. We have no idea whether that means it's easy to invest or not. Um, and, and E is saying, hey, sometimes there's no disreputable characters and still uh, it's difficult to invest. So this is just like number one. Okay. So in general, be careful about things that try to deny the sufficient um, as a way of, of disproving the principle, right? If I said, you know, every time, you know, every time someone goes to Singapore, uh, they lose their baggage, right? And you say, well, I've never been to Singapore uh, and I've never lost my baggage. I'd say, well, you've never been to Singapore. Well, then what does that have to do with that? I'm talking about when people do go to Singapore. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. So we, we want those two. That feel good? Excellent. Good. All right. Now, the second question is a bit uh, different. The second claim is a bit different, right? The first claim was a uh, conditional. 
Uh, and we deal a lot with conditionals in the LSAT. And I want to have at least one conditional thing because this book, again, is full of drills for conditional logic. There's a lot of practice with, you know, unless and only if, and, you know, if this, then that, or that, and contraposing it. And that is really good stuff to do. I think of it as like the, the math of the LSAT. Just you need to know your arithmetic and algebra, so to speak, on the LSAT. You have to know how to work with conditional logic really well. Um, and just like real life math, sometimes if you know it well enough, you don't have to do it out, right? If I understand math well, I might just be able to answer a question in words without having to write the equations, right? Well, um, you know, that definitely applies there. But here we have a bit different kind of thing because they're making uh, a causal argument. Yeah, a lot of times we don't think of things as conditional, so we don't have to. You know, some, a lot of things we say in real life are conditional, but it doesn't matter. It's just academically you could say that. Anytime I say that something is true, you could say it's a conditional, right? So if I say dogs are mammals, technically that's a conditional. If dog, then mammal. Even if I say a specific thing, this dog is a beagle. If you're this dog, then you're a beagle. I mean, it's not very interesting, right, that it's a conditional. Technically, it is one. But there are a lot of cases where when we think conditionally, we can start thinking about sufficients and necessaries, and it connects a lot of the dots of the LSAT. It's like a secret code behind the LSAT. It's good to know. This other argument, though, is a causal argument, right? When they say is responsible for, it's a reason. They're not saying, in general, if there's a new restaurant, there's more business. They're just saying this new restaurant caused this new business right? Which is a big difference, right? Because I might think something caused, some, you know, that was a certain cause in one case and would be different in another case, right? So if I say something like, you know, Fred was late to work because he was drunk, right? Does that mean that I think that everyone who's late to work is drunk or everyone who's drunk becomes late to work? No, not necessarily, right? I just think it was true in this case. So we want to deal with this case in specific. Right, so this is this this first one was was a uh, conditional argument, conditional claim, and this second one is a causal claim. Um, so, did you spot any here that seem to serve as good counterexamples? First one, yes, right. So, why is that? Why is that a good counterexample? Ah, so the effect was already happening before the cause, right? It, notice that it doesn't have to explain why. Sometimes with causal arguments, we want to explain why it happened, right? So, so if, you, uh, if you read, I don't know, a book I don't like about the LSAT, there's some LSAT book where I say, oh, don't read that, and you read it and your score goes up, and I want to say, well, it wasn't because of the book. You might say, well, what was it then? Well, you were also eating a lot of kale during that month, then maybe the kale made you smarter. <laughs> so I need something else. But sometimes we don't have to do it on the LSAT. Sometimes we just show that there is no way that could have been the cause. So sometimes we, I, we introduce an alternative cause, and sometimes we weaken the proposed cause and say, that's not right. That can't be it. All right? Um, and so here we're showing uh, the cause, you know, the effect was already underway. for the proposed cause, that doesn't mean that, there, that it couldn't have been the cause. It doesn't prove us wrong because maybe uh, the restaurant drove a lot more business or maybe that, uh, that increase uh, was gonna drop off and, and the restaurant picked it back up. Or maybe, you know, maybe every year a new thing caused increased business. So one year a movie theater opened and that drew customers. And another year uh, a bookstore opened and that drew customers. And this year was a new restaurant and that drew customers. So it doesn't prove the argument wrong, but it does make us question it, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, any others that you thought were, were, were useful or was this the only one? No worries. Yeah, so uh, let's see, what about number three? So what if it says most shoppers at the shopping center do not eat at the new restaurant? Does that tell us, would that make us think that, that the new business couldn't be from the new shoppers? Um, 
what if I had a very specific store? What if I said, <clears throat> um, what if I said something like, instead of restaurant, what if I said it was a uh, Hindi bookstore? All the books are in Hindi, right? And that's responsible for the increased business of the local shopping center. Could that be true even if most of the people who visit the shopping center don't know Hindi and don't, aren't looking for Hindi books? Could it still be true that the Hindi bookstore was, was driving more business to the center? Basically, we do we need to know if most of the peeper, peep, peepers, most of the people at the at the center are going to this place, right? Um, yeah. So if the Hindi bookstore attracted more people to the mall, it doesn't matter if it's the majority, right? Maybe every day, you know, twenty thousand people come to the mall, and it used to be eighteen thousand. So out of the 20,000, maybe 2,000 are coming to this restaurant or to this Hindi bookstore, and the rest aren't. But that's still enough to drive. Uh, that's still enough to say it's responsible for the increased business. What if every single new customer who comes goes to that restaurant, but only those customers, right? I imagine I, I brought up Hindi bookstore because it's a specialized thing that not everyone would necessarily want. Right, but it could have been everything. Maybe the restaurant is a specific kind of restaurant. It's a vegan restaurant, or a keto restaurant, or a gluten-free restaurant, or something that is going to appeal to some people, maybe and not others. Uh, but if it draws those people in, or draws in new people who wouldn't previously have gone to them all, right? But now they go because of that specialty thing. Then you can see why that would matter. So we don't need to worry about what most people do. And a lot of times I'll try to distract us with quantity statements on the L side. It's not that quantity statements don't ever matter. They can matter a lot. But we don't necessarily need to know anything about most. We just need to know about the people who are coming. Now, if they had something that said most of the new shoppers don't eat there, then you might wonder, is the new restaurant really responsible if the new people who are coming, like if they really were able to look and like, here's all the people who have been coming to the shopping center for years, and here are the people who just started coming. Do they go to the restaurant? They did not. Then that would make you think, of course, there was something else involved. That's right. Because it's a new restaurant. And so we're not, so it's not about increased business for the restaurant. It's about increased business for the mall, for the shopping center. They're saying, hey, why is there more business here? Because of the shopping center. And so it's, it's a typical case of correlation causation. We see two things. There's a new restaurant and business is up. And so, of course, the new restaurant would like to take credit. Hey, business is up because of us. Everyone who's coming to your stores, you're welcome because they all came to eat at our restaurant. And we're trying to figure out if that's true. Um, and so it was, if we found out that most shopping center, most visitors do go to this restaurant, that's a good sign. Uh, but if they don't, that doesn't necessarily prove anything, right? There still could be a lot of people coming, even if it's not most. So what, one thing you want to think about is most has a very specific meaning. It means more than half. And what we'd have to think about, is it important that more than half of the people eat at the restaurant? Is that a necessary threshold, right? No, not necessarily. Just like anytime you're trying to understand a crowd, you know, why did the stock market go down today? Why is it crowded downtown? You know, uh, why did this thing happen? Does it need to be the majority was, was doing this, right? No, you know, if there's a crowd downtown and it turns out there's a convention being held, maybe most people downtown are just doing their jobs. But if in addition to all the normal people doing their jobs, there are a bunch of people going to a convention, even if it's the minority, that still is enough to, you know, make it more crowded downtown. Okay. And then the other ones, you know, D says there were five other restaurants. Okay. That's nice. But is the new restaurant helping? We don't care if there were other ones, right? Some people don't like the restaurant and think it's too expensive, but are they going? Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what effect is that having? Right. Um, B is trying to be a counterexample because it's saying, look, this place, uh, there was a new restaurant and business went down. What do you think about that one? Why isn't, why isn't B an important uh, counterexample?
and B does seem to say that you know a, a new restaurant can can be bad, right? Well, but why is another town? So I, I'm seeing you say another town's mall could be irrelevant, um, but why? Why aren't we concerned about that if we're trying to say that the restaurant drove, drove business? What makes it irrelevant here? I think if we can answer this well, we can make a big distinction between the first column of this drill and the second column. Hmm. Okay. Well, one way to think about it is this. In the first column, we're trying to make a general statement. We're trying to say, if this happens, this happens, right? Anytime there are disreputable characters, it's difficult to invest. In the second one, we're showing that two things already happened. We already know that there was a new restaurant, and we already know there was more business. We're not worrying about if there is more business or not. We know there was. What we're worried about is why, okay? And so certainly, knowing that a restaurant can, you know, either make business decrease or be correlated with business decreasing uh, is interesting, but it doesn't tell us whether this restaurant had an effect, right? Um, it's, it's trying to broaden to all restaurants, whereas the author is not trying to say that in general restaurants drive business. Notice the fact that there were already restaurants in D wouldn't matter. Um, it's just trying to say that in this case it happened. So I think one, one way to say it is what you already said. Um, it's not relevant what happened to another town, but why? Because we're not trying to generalize. We're not trying to say, here's what always happens. We're trying to say, here's what happened in this case, right? So if I said, you know, um, I don't know, uh, my wife was attracted to me because of my hair, right? It wouldn't weaken it to say, well, you know, I have a friend who fell in love with someone who had no hair. Okay, that's fine. That doesn't really matter, right? We're just saying in this case, here's what we thought happened, right? Clearly, that person fell in love with their partner for something else, right? Other than their hair, right? Um, so that's the difference between a generalization we're trying to make often in a in a conditional question where we're trying to say anytime the sufficient happens, the necessary happens, versus a correlation causation situation where we see two things together um, and we're trying to say this is what caused the other, and that's a really interesting thing because a lot of times we're trying to say will the in, in a conditional, we'll say, will these things happen together? In a causal argument, we already know they happen together. The form looks something like this, X and Y happen, and they're saying X causes Y. Um, generally, we have a few possibilities uh, in terms of, of weakening that. We can just show that X couldn't cause Y. All right, we could say it's not possible. Or we could try to say that Y causes X. Oh, it's actually the increased business that caused the new restaurant to open. It wasn't the other way around or something else caused both, uh, right? Um, they, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the new restaurant uh, got, uh, uh, it was upgraded so it was more accessible or it had some other feature added to it and that's why they now have another restaurant and that's why there's more people, things like that. In some cases it makes more sense than others, right? So if I try to say something like, uh, people who smoke don't make very much money, right? Which way does the causation go? If there is any, it could be a coincidence, but usually it won't be. It'll be something like, well, either smoking makes you not earn money or not earning money makes you smoke or something else causes both. Like maybe if you don't have as much education, you won't earn as much money and you also are more likely to smoke. So things like that, those are really common. Okay, cool. Um, since the causation comes up a lot, let's play with it a little bit more. So let's try something instead of from the five pound book, let's try something um, from the real LSAT. So this is an example I'll tell you in advance of a causal argument. So what I'd like you to do is try to predict an answer. And as much as possible, I don't know if you're already doing this, as much as possible, I always try to predict an answer before I go in. And one of the things we talk about in the drill book is ways to predict answers and checking to see if you're making good predictions. So uh, see if you can come up with any predictions of what we're looking for in this one before we look at the answers. And let me know when you're ready.
Okay, good. So anytime they attribute a cause, we have to think about are there other possible causes. So you're saying, hey, what if there are other causes for the increase of mercury levels in birds' feathers? And if I want to really push you, I could say, well, what are they? But in a, in a sense, that might be a waste of time. We don't care what the other causes is. It could be aliens came and, and put mercury in them. We don't really care. It just has to be something else. Okay, so they're saying um, the, the birds get mercury from fish, uh, so the fish mercury levels must be higher. Now, it is interesting that they make a statement that says the mercury is derived from fish. So normally I would say, sure, you're assuming there's no some other cause, but it's interesting that they're saying that's where they get the mercury from. So if, if let's, let's say that they're right, that that's where all the mercury in the seabirds come from, then do we have to accept that if there's more mercury, then the fish are higher in mercury? Sure. Uh, what I'm saying is, let's say we accept what they say about the mercury comes just from the fish that they eat. That's where the mercury comes from. If that's true, if the mercury comes from the fish that they eat, then do we have to accept then that if mercury has gone up, that the fish must have more mercury? In other words, is there a way for all the mercury to come from the fish without the fish being higher in mercury? possible. So we'd have to see something that explains it. So again, we don't have to think about this. Um, but we can expect, uh, we can expect the, uh, an answer that's stated in the negative, right? A positive statement might be something like the mercury comes from fish and not something else, right? But even that's somewhat negative. But they've said the mercury comes from fish. So we can expect the answer to be ruling out some other explanation, right? And that's a really good prediction all in, by itself to have, right? Uh, even in the absence of, of anything more specific. So often in a causal argument, we will have these sort of broad predictions. Sometimes we'll say, hey, it's the other way around. Here, it doesn't quite make sense, right? Um, we're not gonna say, oh no, really, it's it's not the, you know, the fish that caused the mercury, it's the mercury that causes the fish. What does that even mean, right? So I think in ruling out another possibility makes a lot more sense. Okay, see if you find an answer that you like. All right, let's see what we can do here. So I'm seeing C, mercury derived from a fish is essential for the normal, normal growth of a seabird's feathers. So uh, why do we want the author to assume that? Yeah. 
If the mercury were not essential for the seabird's feathers, would that be a problem for the argument? So one thing that's interesting, so A is 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 pro proposed as a somewhat negative one. So A, A in some senses is more promising, although we need to look at it. Um, one thing that we can watch out for, since we predicted that we were going to be ruling out another cause, um, we want to be careful about ones that aren't ruling anything out. Um, so if you look at B, the amount of mercury depends on the amount of pollution. But notice it doesn't say anything about whether there is more mercury or not and C, mercury is essential, these are both positive. And although that in itself wouldn't necessarily definitively prove they're wrong, it is a big problem for us here. Um, it does make me, you know, on a first pass, likely not to consider those because I'm trying to rule out a cause and these are saying, here's something that is true. But if the mercury is essential for the growth of the seabird's feathers, it still doesn't help me understand why there's more mercury now than before. Is it because the fish are higher in mercury or is it because of something else, right? Um, and same thing with B, the amount of mercury in fish depends on the amount of pollution, but hold on, is there more pollution now? Does that prove it? And how does it go? It could even, it's hard to imagine, but it could even go the other way. It doesn't say maybe the more pollution, the less mercury in the fish, right? So I don't really know enough from B. In real life, we would probably know that there's more pollution in the ocean now than in the 1880s, but there's nothing about it in the argument. So that's probably not something we're going to rely on. So notice that A, B, and C, at least in some sense, are all negative. They're all ruling something out because this says the proportion was not as high. This says the seabirds uh, were not fully grown. And this says the process used to preserve birds did not decrease the amount of mercury. Okay, so let's look at all three of those. So if you look at A, A is saying, well, the seabirds didn't eat as much fish back then as they do today, right? So imagine that today the seabirds eat almost entirely fish. They eat nothing but fish and the occasional French fry, right? Um, but back in 1880, they ate a little bit of fish. They ate some mice they found on the shore. They ate seaweed, you know, whatever. Doesn't matter what they ate, right? Candy bars, right? but they wouldn't eat, weren't eating as much fish. If that were true, what effect would that have, do you think, on the mercury in their body, in their feathers? Do you see what effect it would have? In other words, if, if seabirds just ate more fish now than they used to? more fish, more mercury. So then could that explain why mercury levels are higher now? Is it possible that the fish haven't changed and just the, the diet of the birds has changed? Like if I go to the movies and eat popcorn all the time and they haven't changed the popcorn and yet I'm getting heavier and heavier, it could be that the popcorn has gotten less healthy, it's gotten more fat in it, or maybe I'm just eating more of it. I used to go to the movies and have a popcorn, you know, once a month, and now I go every other day and I eat more of it, right? So, okay, that's going to make me bigger, right? So A is a very interesting and relevant consideration we have to think about. Hey, maybe it's not that the fish have more mercury individually. Maybe they're just eating a larger percent of fish in their diet, right? That can make a difference. So if A is true, would that strengthen or weaken the author's argument? Does that support the argument or go against it? In other words, if we knew that that birds were just eating more fish now. And so presumably that was loading them up with mercury. 
would that support or go against the argument that the fish are higher in mercury individually, that the levels in fish are higher? It would weaken the argument. So does that make a, a good answer or a bad one? Yeah, right. So that's why it's so important to recognize what your job is. And I'm going to use that as one last push on the five pound book in just a second. We'll talk about this, right? Um, so yeah, this is a weaken. To phrase this as an assumption, they'd have to make this negative. They have to say, um, it's not the case that, uh, maybe they'd, an easier way to phrase it instead of saying it's not that they weren't as high, you could say something like, um, seabirds eat no more fish now than they used to. Or uh, fish does not make up a larger proportion of a seabird's diet than it did in 1880. See, that would be an assumption the author is making. Absolutely. The way it's phrased now is going the other way. So one way the LSAT will distract us, aside from just making things that are very difficult to interpret in the first place, is they'll go the wrong direction. They'll make a really good point, but it's a point for the other team, and we don't want to do that. Then they'll do things that are just aren't good points. D is talking about seabirds, whether they're full grown. Uh, they don't compare 1880 to now, and so we don't know if that makes a difference. Plus, even if they, even if they were comparing 1880s now, some full grown, some not, we still don't know what effect that's supposed to have. It's, so it's really out of scope. Whereas notice what E does is it rules out another possibility. Right? So it rules out an alternative cause which is a really common thing to do on causal arguments. It's basically saying, maybe it's not that birds now have more mercury. Uh, maybe the, the old birds have just lost mercury in preservation. Right? I mean, imagine that you looked at um, an ancient palace and a palace from today, and you said, wow, people in old days, you know, the rich people, the royal people weren't very fancy. Look how bad this palace is, and there aren't any jewels, and there's no gold, and it looks terrible. And someone says, well, yeah, it's an ancient palace. It's been out of use for 2,000 years, and all the gold and jewels are gone. They've been stolen or fallen, right? And, and no one's cleaned it lately, right? It's not a fair comparison. Um, and so the same thing here, we're trying to compare birds from the 1880s with today, assuming that the birds from the 1880s are, are in pristine shape, that nothing's changed. Maybe they were full of mercury. Maybe they even had more mercury than, than birds now until they were preserved and the mercury went away. All right. Um, and so uh, that, I mean, imagine instead of mercury, you said water. Well, they're dried out birds. They're going to have less water in them, right? Um, so that that would... If we negate this, if we say the process did substantially decrease the amount of mercury, it would really ruin the argument. So do you see why that's a necessary assumption? Why we can't really do without that? Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in our books, we'll talk about the negation test, this idea that if you knock out uh, a potential necessary assumption, it should ruin the argument. Right? It makes the argument no longer make sense. So if I say, hey, the birds from the 1880s have less mercury, uh, but preserving them reduced the amount of mercury, then how do we know that it's because of the fish? Why don't we think it's just because of that process? It really ruins the argument. Excellent. Good. If you want to look at that again, that's in the free June 2007, 2007 exam, which you could download online. It's section three, number 11. I just want to relate this to something. We won't have time to do this right now. Uh, but we'll uh, just something you can try out. And if you have that book, it would be useful one to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. Trying to understand what they're trying to say is a big part of, of this test. Just interpreting, just, just getting it, right? And so knowing, recognizing the task and responding well to the task is really important. So one drill we do in the book um, that I would want to recommend is looking for ways to, when you see a causal claim, think about in advance, how would I strengthen and how would I weaken it? In which way would it go? So imagine I have a statement like this, playing a musical instrument improves one's ability to solve math problems. Now on the real test, of course, there's always going to be a premise and a conclusion. So either they'll give you a premise that says these are correlated, like, hey, people who score well on math tests often also play a music instrument. So playing the instrument must make you better at math. Um, or they'll say something like, uh, 
they'll or they'll show uh, that someone's good at math, and you'll say, "I think here's why." Right? It'd be pretty strange if they just said, uh, "You know, Karen did well in the math test, so she must play an instrument," without having mentioned musical instruments before. But they could, right? Um, it might make more sense if it's something more obvious, right? So if I say something like, uh, you know, Karen got a perfect score on the math test uh, without studying, so she must have cheated. And you say, well, I can see why you think so, but where did cheating come from? Maybe she was just really good at it. She already knew how to do this, right? Um, who knows, right? Um, so we're always looking for ways to, to strengthen a weekend. So looking at this one, um, there's different ways we might do it depending on the information we have. So if we know, uh, if we know these things go together, we could still try to, to reverse it or show an alternative cause. So reverse causality would be something like, hey, it's not that playing a music gets you better at math. Those two things are correlated, but it's actually the mathematical ability that makes you better at playing a musical instrument. Right? Or there could be an alternative cause. Maybe people who play musical instruments and people who are good at math are both have something else in common, like they're wealthy and that gives them advantages or um, they have some other underlying ability that, that, that makes them both better at both things, or they have tutors or you know, something like that. Right? If I'm simply trying to break it apart, I could also just show that, hey, they're not always correlated. So if I say, hey, you know, um, in this study, people who played a music instrument didn't do any better on math. Right? Maybe it depends on the specific situation. Maybe the author tries to generalize. They showed some people who were in a choir not a choir, that's not a musical instrument, people who are in a symphony um, and, just, and they were good at math, but maybe in other cases, it's not playing a musical instrument. So maybe it's actually uh, playing in an ensemble that's good for you and not just playing a musical instrument in general. So the idea is be able to brainstorm. And a lot of these, you can go either way with them. Once I recognize that there are other causal possibilities, I could go other way. I could identify an alternative cause to weekend. I could say, oh, it's really, um, it's really, uh, nutrition that causes both of these things to be better. Or I can weaken it by saying, you know, uh, these aren't both caused by whatever it is, nutrition, social status, wealth, et cetera. Okay. So this is a really good thing to brainstorm and work on. So how do you answer something like this? Well, in the book, we'll go through what are some other possibilities for each one? What are some things you could propose? Uh, what's the question here? What's the difference between necessary assumptions eliminate alternative cause versus when strengthening, uh, eliminating your alternative cause. Um, in a sense, nothing, because a necessary assumption is strengthening. The, diff the, the only difference is in a strengthen, we're looking for something where if it were true, um, it would force the argument, uh, well, to be better, not necessarily force the argument to write. Something that if it were true would help the argument. Um, and it could be more extreme, right? So for instance, if I find out that, um, that every single person who has ever played a musical instrument was good at math, um, that would strengthen. But does that need to be true for this to be true? Maybe musical instruments make you better without everyone being really good, right? Um, and so necessary assumptions are things that we need to have, but they're not always really strongly worded. Um, but in some cases, they really overlap. If you look at the one we just did, uh, the, where to go? Um, the right answer could definitely be used as a strengthen. If the process didn't decrease the amount of mercury, that strengthened the argument, right? Um, so they're not exactly, uh, they're not always different, um, but there's more ways that you can strengthen. There are ways, let me put it this way. There are ways that you can strengthen that aren't necessary because they're too extreme, they're too specific, they didn't happen to ha have to happen this particular way. Um, whereas uh, something that's necessary to the argument, by definition, would strengthen it because it's something that the argument has to have. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Well, hey, I hope you found this helpful. Um, if you do want to check out one of our classes, let us know. If there's anything I can discuss with you beyond this, um, definitely let me know too. I'm going to shut down the recording, but thanks for for coming in and thanks for watching at home and uh, good luck with everything.